everybody. Today is one of those days when you sit back and kind of wonder during the holidays, are you really worried about your uncle coming into the uh, uh, front room and saying, these three guys walked into a bar? Well, I happen to be here with two other of those guys. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and I'm here with two compadres where three podcasters walk into a bar. First around the corner is RT. R.T. Trevino is one of the head dogs over there at Pecos Operating Country, and he is the podcast host for The Crude Truth, not just The Crude Truth, The Crude Truth. Oh, yes, I am. It is The Crude Truth, but I'll tell you what, uh, my other crude truth today is that I'm just happy and excited to get back with the think tank here of Stu Turley and and David. So, uh, uh, you know, happy holidays and Merry Christmas, everybody. Hopefully we'll knock out one more before Christmas, I'm sure. Uh, but he hello, everybody. And uh, hello from Pecos Country Operating. There you go. Next around the corner. Just I had to say that to wake him up. He's so old. Moses is proud to call him brother. <laughs> All right. We got the David Lackman. David is the uh, uh, CEO. What is he? President yeah. Yeah, what is it? He's the CEO and president of DB uh, Energy, and he has one called the Energy Question. And for our podcast listeners, he was having a hard time getting his head in the screen. He's moving the camera <laughs> around and everything else. So um, we are going to have a great show. We have got so much rich, uh, target rich environment for uh, David. You run the uh, energy absurdity of, you know, of the day. I'm sorry, my day is not made unless you've got a really good publication going out there. And I, I just sit there and wait at 4 a.m. for <laughs> you to get up and get me in an energy absurdity of the day. What do you got going on with energy absurdities right now? Oh, uh, well, let me look. <laughs> There's so many of them. I, I forget which one's current. Um, what did I do today? Dad gum. Having a senior moment. Let's go look here. Let's ask Moses. I'm sorry. I, I swear I'm going to get to this in just a second. Uh, corn ethanol was my energy absurdity to, of the day. I noticed that the Democratic Party was uh, changing its primary calendar to move <laughs> Iowa back on the calendar in order to make it easier for Joe Biden to get renominated at the age of 82 in 2024. Um, and, you know, I've always been an advocate to move Iowa back down the calendar and get it away from the first first uh, nominating right. contest, just, you know, because of the ethanol subsidies. Right. And, and every four years, we have every presidential candidate of both parties, you know, goes to Iowa to bend the knee to the corn ethanol people and, yeah. and right. promise to extend those subsidies. And it's the biggest bunch of nonsense and the most use, useless fuel we produce in this country. Yep. And so, you know, I was just saying I'm all for it, man. Move it down the calendar. Just do it for the right reason. Wow. Well, you know, uh, is, you... There a right, is there a right reason anymore, David? That's really the question. You know, everybody has their own reason and everybody has their own thought and their own truth, so yeah. to speak, on it. You know, I, what I, is I, truth? I, I can't I can't disagree uh, with you at all. I mean, the way that these. Uh, people, they focus on the corn. It's like when they actually go back and look, it actually takes more uh, oil to make a gallon of gasoline with ethanol than it does just to make a gallon of gasoline with oil. Oh, so, sure. uh, you know, that to me is uh, an absurdity right there uh, that that here we are trying to get corn um, and not to mention also the fact that we're using a product that we eat on a normal basis to make energy when we have an, a gr other great ways to make, you know, cheap, reliable, abundant amounts of energy. Right. Um, you know, let alone if um, I know, I remember one time and I'll, I'll, I'll get on this uh, quick story. We were in Mexico many, many years ago. And my, uh, my, my father was there. My mother's there. Uh, my grandfather was there. This was 1989. And my grandfather came from a village that there really, there was like, one electrical uh, light bulb in the house, uh, barely any running water. And uh, one of the aunts asked my father, because uh, he was already doing some oil and gas at that time. Uh, and he goes, is it true that you guys use gasoline or excuse me, use corn, not only to, uh, they, uh, to uh, 
uh, do uh, make gasoline, but also feed the cattle? And my dad goes, <laughs> absolutely. And she got appalled. That's like, well, that's one of our main sources of food and nutrients. Right. It's like, why are y'all wasting all of that? It's like, if America has too much of that, why are they not sending it to us in other countries? Yeah. So that's something that sticks out with me as well. Uh, being yep. able to see that growing up, it had an impact going, wow, what are we doing to where we're taking our food sources and turning them into energy at a time when there's no need for that at all? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy hey. policy. So anyway, I just think that's really such a great thing. You know, Stu, what do you think about, you know, all these, uh, once again, they're doing this Iowa thing. I, I, one of the things that I really enjoyed was I, I had a, a podcast uh, with Deborah Wald and she's the CEO over at Green Lily and they've got um, out of Europe, they've got uh, technology that they make biodiesel and ethanol without having to use all those extra resources and it's coming out of trash and it's coming out of, you sit here and go through all of their stuff that's real biofuel it's not using food i'm like whoa so Let's basically what you're saying is we got back to the future part two in real life where you had yep. dot going there and throwing uh, the empty beer the beer can and the trash into yep. the vehicle yeah could you imagine if that we could actually make that like just a real thing what we could do with actually all the trash and talk about renewable yep. energy and reduce yep. reuse yeah. recycle right it's here it's now and we got uh, well it. we uh, just need once again you know I, I know there's other forms of energy out there and i am once again i am all for them but they yep. need to be reliable and affordable you bet if they and here's the thing about their renewable stuff and i'm going to get off of this one but their renewable stuff does not need tax subsidies oh they can compete with power and ethanol and biodiesel so biodiesel guys has what two dollars uh, additional whenever you have diesel and you have to add bio to the word bio it gets two dollars per gallon I think something like that, something like right? That. Yeah. They don't need the tax subsidies. They don't need the extra waste. Wow. What's up with that bad dog? <laughs> well, if you're not going to become a ward of the state, a rent seeking industry, then the politicians aren't going to support you. I no. mean, this is all a game about uh, political power and money. Oh and, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the companies that are willing to become wards of the federal government are, are the ones that are going to get the feet at the trough. And, uh, it's a big trough right now. Yeah, oink. Hey, uh, <laughs> as Dan Bongino would say, it's a porculus bill. All right. Hey, uh, RT, what about OPEC? Yeah, let's turn this bad dog over to uh, uh, OPEC and Russia price cap. What are you hearing there? Yeah, no, I'm hearing there that uh, they are getting ready to, or no, they just approved a price cap on the Russian oil at $60 a barrel. Um, so that means now that that's the most everybody's going to be able to pay for Russian <laughs> oil, if I'm correct, which theoretically yeah. way when we're at seventy seven dollar oil, which is a perfect number for operators and, and um, you know, people that invest in oil and gas. Seventy seven is perfect. Um, so now they're going to be able to go buy it from somebody else who's forced to sell it at sixty dollar oil. Um, so that's a concern of mine. But then also, I want to ask you two guys, you know, as, as an operator working out in the field every day, you know, is that something that our government could ever force us to do is to, is to force the price of WTI to be sold at a certain price or for Brent to be sold at a certain price? Is that something we could ever possibly see here in America? Uh, David, I'll let you answer and I'll give you my <laughs> one and a half cent. Well, I mean, not if we're observing. Uh the constitution and the laws, okay. but uh, this administration, you know, has a pretty long track record already of ignoring both. Uh, you know, can they do it? Uh, I don't really see how they would be able to do such a thing. You, it would require the cooperation of the United States government and all these other governments to refuse to buy production, you know, from a, an American company at a price above a certain level. And, you know, right now they're trying to do this to Russia through the G7 and the European Union 
governmental entities. Okay. But, but there's all kinds of exceptions to it. For example, Japan is part of the G7. And Japan, but Japan pledged on Monday that they're going to enforce this price cap, except for oil coming to Japan from Sakhalin Island, Russia's operations, on, which is where Japan gets most of its imported oil from, right? Okay. Right. So it's, it's, it's just nonsense. It's unenforceable. Russia has always already figured out workarounds. Um, you know, the cap is supposed to be at $60. Russia was selling oil in Asia the day it went into effect at $79, $19 above the cap. And, and these, you know, it's a farce. It's, it's a bunch of politicians trying to convince their constituents that they're, they're being tough on Putin while they're really not doing anything very effective at all to Putin. And um, Except poking him. Yeah, it's just a, a typical government farce. And uh, I, I know, don't know what else to say about it. You know, David and NRT, what got me all worked up this weekend as you know, my this is one of those things I get all worked up on. It's the they're putting sanctions on the uh, insurance companies in the UK for insuring shipments for uh, tankers. That covers ninety five percent of the traffic out there. So if you're a insurance carrier and you uh, try to insure a shipment and they are transporting it more than $60, that's who they go after is the insurance company. Right, right. And so if we look at BRICS, BRICS has in there, they have a new thing where they're creating an insurance company and, and holding groups so that they will be able to pull all of this insurance away from the UK and all of a sudden going, now it doesn't matter. Sanctions won't matter anywhere they go. So this is all a farce. Well, and who are the biggest customers of Russian crude exports right now? China and India, both of whom are part of the BRICS alliance. In India today, at December 6th, signaled it will continue to buy oil from Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and then India has already been buying oil from Russia at a discounted price in the yeah. $60 to $70 range. Right. Right. Well, so, I mean, it's already right in line with the supposed cap. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just Russia has said, Russia's response was that they won't honor the cap. They'll find a ways to work around it. And if they can't sell all their crude at market prices, you know, that are negotiated between two willing parties, then they'll just withhold the oil from the market. Well, well, you know, and uh, who who am I to be somebody to force somebody to pay more for something when there's an option for it to be paid and to be purchased at a lesser price? In no. fact, you know, you, you talk about this administration. I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up buying that discounted Russian oil to fill back up the strategic reserve down the road. I wouldn't either. You know, nothing this administration does would surprise me. Very no, much. actually, I think we'd be buying back, uh, what is it, Synoptic, that Hunter Biden, we sold a million barrels to. Just kidding. Oh, Sonopec? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> okay, that one. Uh, uh, anyway, so as we go <laughs> along down the road here, uh, RT, yeah. as an EMP operator here in the U.S., what are you seeing coming around the corner? You said the magic number of $70, $75 uh, is good for you. As you're pumping oil right now and you're trying to build everything up for you, what are some of your hot buttons in the field drilling right now? Oh, wow. Uh, my hot button right now is service cost. You know, the pipe, mm -hmm. the, the, the cost, uh, the uh, uh, service cost, and not necessarily all service companies and their costs. But let me let me be more specific. Material costs. My material costs are still at over a hundred dollar price material, um, wow. and so um, I, what I'm a little worried about as an operator. Um, and EMP, of course, is expiration and production is what EMP stands for. Um, what I'm worried about is will those prices go up? And these service companies. Um, 
that are also still high, will they go back up again? Because here we are at $77 oil. I am prepared mentally and physically for oil to go back up to that $95 to $105 range in the next six months. Wow. I do think we're going to get there. And so for us at Pecos Country Operating, we are waiting right there to start, you know, start producing and really take advantage of what will probably be at that point, 12 to 18 months of $100 oil again. Uh, but that's my hot button right now because, see, the, the prices haven't come down uh, right. to match where the price of oil is. However, that being said, the supply has not gone up to match the demand that we have. This price right now, and why I think the prices are gonna go back up, is this is a, a the mafioso uh, word fugazi. This price is not real, the $77 oil. Why? Because we're still importing from our strategic reserve to cover the demand with and add to the supply that we don't have. So at some point, these prices will realign and we will shoot back up to $95, $105 oil. Um, so right now, again, my hot ticket is really the fact that I'm paying $100 prices, $100 oil prices uh, at 77. Now, I, uh, one more thing and I'll, I'll get off of it. I do think that $77, $75 oil is the perfect number for this U.S. economy to really thrive and go. Um, when we see $75 oil, we're looking at somewhere between an average of $2 and $2.50 in gasoline, and which means the economy can travel, uh, our prices go down on goods, services across America. Right. And more importantly, uh, in my industry, I'm making a dollar. Um, you know, when, when we go down and things like that, you know, everything does change. And, and that's the truth. $75 oil is the perfect place where the economy grows and everybody is making money. So yeah. yeah. There's there's my little hot ticket. I'll tell you that's fantastic, RT. David, I'm glad you moved. I thought we were gonna have to put your glasses <laughs> under your nose there to see if you're still alive. So the the other thing about the price, uh, you know, the other bullish factor that, that's about to happen is China is uh releasing this zero COVID restrictions in a, in a lot of parts of the country now. Uh, because of the mass protests that they yep. had, uh, uh, the government is backing off from some of those restrictions. And when that happens, demand for crude in China is going to go back up very substantially, very quickly. And, uh, you know, uh, unless OPEC is willing to jump in and raise production, which they have a very limited ability to do right now, um, it's going to be hard to contain prices, I think, below you know, the Brent price at least uh, would probably be approaching the $100 mark again in the first quarter of next year. Uh, you, you, bet. you know, David, you uh, mentioned China um, and how OPEC will probably, uh, you know, what uh, China is going to uh, ease the restriction. So their demand is going to go up and that OPEC, you know, will they or will they not um, release more production? I, do, I did hear today that they are actually, the president of China and uh, the uh, group out of Saudi Arabia are supposed to be meeting today or tomorrow to be discussing what alliance they will have, and they will have an alliance. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to uh, touch on that, if y'all don't mind, for a brief second, because um, um, Stu, you mentioned this two years ago when you and I met for lunch. This was part of your whole deal with Russia. And, right. But I want to start and I want, I want people to salivate over that and start over with David. You know, David, what do you think will come out of this meeting uh, between China and uh, Saudi Arabia? Well, probably nothing formal yet uh, in terms of Saudi Arabia joining the BRICS alliance. But uh, I'm sure that's a topic of discussion. The Saudis have been making moves in that direction now for over a year. Yep. And with the Biden administration you know, it's pretty obvious overt hostility towards Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think that just pushes them inevitably into that posture. But, I, I, you know, I, I would expect them to make some, some announcements about uh, China's intent to purchase more oil from Saudi Arabia uh, in the months to come as their demand rank, uh, ramps back up. And they'll probably make some 
some agreements in terms of economic development uh, opportunities between those two countries. And, yep. uh, you know, so it's just we're, we're in the United States. Our government is pushing uh, the most important Middle Eastern oil producer into that China orbit. And um, it's a very, very dangerous thing for America's future energy security to be doing that. Yeah. You know, RT and David, those are great, great points. And and when you take a look at BRICS and BRICS Plus in China's orbit, you see only the United States, Canada, and a little bit of Europe, and the rest of the world is red. And that means that the, and that's 50% of the population of the world will be orbiting around China. Yeah. That is not very far off. Yeah, Stu, I mean, the I, inroads China's made in Africa and South America are just incredible over that, the last decade. And They own South America. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, scary. it's scary. If I may, Stu, uh, please, uh, for our listeners out there, what does BRICS and BRICS Plus stand for again? Uh, it's what you don't want to have you drop on your foot. No, BRICS is, uh, it is the... Uh, who are, there's four there's the countries for it it david what are they brazil they, russia brazil, china india china and south africa right BRICS. and then bricks and then bricks plus is another 23 or four i think even more than that. affiliated countries yeah. whoa i did not i did not know there were that many loosely affiliated countries so that, you know there, i felt like it was yes. kind of a, like a spelling bee just now bricks Brazil, Russia, right. India, China, South Africa, BRICS. And, you know, if you add Saudi Arabia to it, you just add another S at the end. Bricks. So still pronounced the same. And, and then you now you know why I was doing uh, David. <laughs> <laughs> but you think about that. You, so you've already got uh, uh, China and and India are the second and third largest economies on Earth. India just surpassed Germany. Um, Brazil is the largest economy in South America on the South American continent. South Africa is the largest economy on the African continent. Wow. Uh, you add Saudi Arabia, the largest economy in the Middle East to that, and you have a set of economies that is every bit a rival to the G7. And, um, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint, they're already really in a severe, superior posture to the G7, uh, when you look at all the inroads China has made in places like Venezuela and Brazil and, and all over the African continent, it's really uh, a very dangerous, dangerous thing. Very frightening. I think I want to be able to kind of bring that up um, here. Uh, I know I've got some other good, inter uh, I think that needs to be something that needs to be mentioned on a daily basis for the next few months. I mean, that's, you know, uh, David, when you say it like that, that is, that is, Dare I say, uh, uh, Jin Zhu, or uh, uh, the art of war, positioning yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I butchered his name. I apologize. Uh, Sun Zhu. Sun Zhu. Sun Zhu. And yeah, uh, that you. right there is is textbook 101, the art of war, of uh, positioning yourself uh, for a takeover without losing one man. Uh, well, and and, and you know say, what hey, else? South guys? Africa is is this large economy of, of I didn't even think of it from that aspect of yeah. that they have now every continent's largest, well, except for North America and Europe. So and Australia. Yeah. And Australia. Yeah. Wow. Uh it's gonna get ugly, dude. Uh, hey, um anyway. Wait, before we before we change, one last thing about that is Venezuela. The, the administration just eased sanctions on Venezuela. Yeah. Well, who are two of Venezuela's most biggest strategic partners now? Russia and China, right? And so if, you, if you're easing sanctions on Venezuela, you're easing sanctions on Russia and China. Yeah, you're exactly and, right, David. And, and uh, Chevron basically was not very happy because Biden said, oh, we're going to give you six, six months. months. Yeah. And, and Chevron was, I, I looked at some reports and it will take a minimum of seven years of investing in that dilapidated fields because of all the equipment, abandoning, you're going to have to get everything restarted. Oil and gas does not come on back online very easily. So you sit back and kind of go, 
guess what's been happening? Russia has been coming out and delivering uh, uh, ships and they sell it to Venezuela and Venezuela has been selling it out somewhere else. So David, you nailed it. The traffic is already there. Yeah. Iran yeah. figured out how to avoid sanctions. Russian and Putin went, hey, that's pretty good. They went and bro and they are teaching Iran how to run around sanctions. Well, and I'm so old, I know who Iran learned that all from, right? I used to work for him. His name was Oscar Wyatt, uh, the CEO <laughs> of Coastal States, who figured out to get how to get around all the sanctions in the late 1970s, put, put in effect by the Carter administration. <laughs> and, and you know, wow. Putin, and, and yeah, and you know, and you know, Putin was over there going. Hey, that's pretty smart, but yeah, <laughs> I would not want to play chess against Putin. He's went, he, he's fighting a bunch of unarmed opponents in a chess match out yes, there. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And intentionally unarmed opponents. It's it's pretty astonishing, really. All right. We're about out of time and we could have about another five hours, but we got it, <laughs> it, it's beer 30 somewhere. Now, yeah. RT, give me your last thoughts coming around the corner. You actually had two really good ones right now, and I think three may give you a headache. <laughs> You're absolutely <laughs> right. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh save the rest for the rest of the year um you know i'm, I'm excited <laughs> to finish 2023 strong or 2022 strong and start a good positive 2023 um i know i've got some good episodes of the crude truth about to come out um and i'm already lining up some great stuff for 2023 um so i'm just excited as always and uh, as as i would say as an operator let's drill baby drill to drill ourselves out of this uh economic issue here in america you bet david your last thoughts yeah, I'm just going to advise everybody to enjoy the low gasoline prices while you still can and maybe take a little road trip after Christmas between Christmas and New Year's and enjoy them. Uh, they're probably not going to last that long. And uh, I hope everyone has a happy holidays and Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and, you know, whatever your religious you beliefs are. There you go. Absolutely. And you know what? I'd like to give everybody a shout out. And thank you for our great listeners. Uh, and they, we've gotten some great feedback. Uh, we encourage everybody to subscribe, like, and uh, when you're listening to this on the podcast channel, uh, any of your favorite channels, give us a review. Uh, tell us we're great. We would but be nice. It. But be nice, yes. <laughs> and it, and when if you want to spell RT's name, it's R T. Now, I have to give everybody a shout out because RT was finally getting some good zings on me right before the show here today. And RT, I am so proud of you that you're just getting to the point where you're able to think about comebacks. I am so proud of you. This is a big day in our relationship. So with that, we will say thank you and uh, look forward to visiting with you guys again soon. All right. Thank you. Adios. We'll